Uh, before we start, uh, we need to recognize that our First Nations have participated in all of Canada's major military conflicts. And during the Second World War, they were involved in every service and every theater of conflict that Canada participated in. We acknowledge that Guelph is situated on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabe peoples, specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation through the Between the Lakes Purchase Number 3 Treaty, uh, 1792. Uh, the Mississaugas of the Credit ceded to the British Crown over 3 million acres of land between Lakes Huron, Ontario, and Erie. Today, Guelph is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Guelph Museums commits to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action, and we must do more to learn, share, and support truth and healing. Guelph Museums continues to build our knowledge relationships with the land, its history, and its peoples, and this commitment informs all that we do at Guelph Museums. Now, um, I'd like to introduce Tim. Uh, he is the great war historian at the Canadian War Museum. Uh, also, he's an adjunct professor at Carleton University. In 2008, uh, which is uh, the day that uh, he gave his first talk at Guelph Museums, uh, he found out that he won the J.W. Defoe Prize for the book At the Sharp End. And he won it again in 2018 for Vimy Shock Troops. And he won uh, in 2009 the Charles Taylor Prize for Literary Nonfiction. Uh, in 2013, uh, Tim received the Pierre Burton Award for popularizing Canadian history, and he's also a member of the Order of Canada. Uh, Tim also contributes to League, Legion magazine, and I just noticed that Tim and uh, have contributed to Canada's History magazine. Um, we did an article on recipes for victory. So I'm wondering if you think going to cook anytime soon. <laughs> Good be, Ken. Good be. Thanks very much. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be back speaking to you. I think as Ken was reminding me, this is my fifth time speaking uh, in Guelph or to people uh, in Guelph and the surrounding area. I wish I could be there with you. Uh, one of my favorite things when I go on my book tours is to meet people and to talk and to uh, share stories. And I love hearing the stories of Canadians from across the country and um, uh, their own personal history and engagement in, in the case of my study with the two world wars. But all of Canadian history matters to me, and I think it's an important part of who we are, uh, who we were in the past, and, and perhaps a way forward. So um, I have a presentation. I'm gonna, we're going to try to make this work. I've, I've been told that this is the first of the, um, first of the lectures in the series, and uh, do you see that all right? I hope, and um, uh, I, I'm going to talk about my new book, The, the Fight for History. The titles matter in my books, and, and if, you, if you know my past books, this is my 13th book, and it's um, the third volume in, in my Canada and the Second World War series. There's a lot of numbers there, 13, second, third, but um, this is one uh, where I think the title really matters to me, and it's, it's the fight for history, because I see history, certainly in this day and age in which we are living, uh, as a very contested uh, field of study. Um, we are going through a period of reconciliation, as Ken has said, and, and which all of us know is important to help, I think, heal uh, some of the wounds that run deep in our country. Uh, but history has always been a struggle. It's not just in the 21st century. There has always been uh, groups that have contested the meaning of history over time. Uh, there have been struggles and, and there have been fights. Um, and, and especially, I think, there has been a fight against forgetting. It's not always groups uh, demanding that their history is presented a, a certain way. Often I've found in my 25 years as uh, first an archivist and now a, a, a curator, or at least a, uh, an historian, that um, we, have to, we have to fight for our own history. And that's part of the message in my book and, and part of the story. This is, as I mentioned, the, the third volume in my Second World War history. I, I didn't think there was going to be even a second volume. Um, the Necessary War, which came out in 2014, as I was writing that, um, it was meant to be a one-volume history. As some of you may know, I wrote a two-volume history on the First World War at the sharp end in 2007 and shock troops, and it nearly killed me. Uh, those were 600-page books back-to-back. -back. I said, never again. But of course, like so many things in this world, we forget about the pain. And as I was writing uh, 
um, uh, the necessary war, I just I kept coming across the staggering contributions of Canada during the Second World War. Of course, the war where Canada was in almost from the very first days when we decided to go to war to stand at Britain's side on the 10th of September 1939 and fighting through the entire war. 1.1 million Canadians served in uniform. That, that's from a country of about 11 and a half million. So almost one in 10 Canadians served in uniform, including 50,000 women. They were English Canadians, they were French Canadians, they were new Canadians, they were indigenous Canadians. They came from across the country, every city, every town, almost every village. That was Canada. And we fought to defend our coasts, both the East Coast and the West Coast. We fought around the world. And one of the things that struck me of course, is that in the Great War, while Canada had forces in the Mediterranean and in a few other places, largely the fighting was confined to the Western Front. But as you probably know, in the Second World War, we fought around the world, a, a, a staggering contribution. Uh, we fought on the oceans, we fought in the air, we fought on land, we defended Canada. Um, it really, really incredible um, the, the way that Canada contributed to the Allied war effort, uh, especially when France fell in June of 1940 and with the Americans um, still neutral until at least 17 or 18 months later. It was a rich and it was a complex history, these two books. And I was very lucky they were national bestsellers. Uh, they won a number of writing awards. And as I was traveling the country talking to people like yourself, one of the things I heard over and over again was um, people thanking me, um, thanking me for telling these stories because they didn't know these stories. They knew aspects of the Second World War and many people who had a father or a grandfather or a grandmother who served um, knew that a personal history. But there was a surprising um, absence, I think, of, of the stories around Canada's Second World War. Uh, and I probed a little deeper as I began to see a pattern here and people said, well, I wondered if they had just not read about World War II. And they said, no, I, I love reading about World War II. I, I read American books and British books and German books. And, I, and they love the television shows and they love the movies and they played with the comic books and the toys. But always these were stories about the Americans, the British, uh, the Germans and other countries. There was so little about Canada. And I found that odd. I found that odd that we didn't celebrate or talk about the significant contributions of Canada in what I have called the necessary war. Um, and I wondered if perhaps, uh, despite the incredible contributions, if, if perhaps the, the Great War had overshadowed um, the memory of the Second World War. And I think that is true to some degree. Uh, I think of Vimy, some of you may know that I wrote Vimy, The Battle and the Legend in 2017. I wanted to know why Vimy still mattered to us as Canadians, why it was on our, uh, why it was in our passport, why it was on the $20 bill, why in that year when this book came out, 25,000 Canadians went to Vimy Ridge. I was a part of that. I was a, an on-air historian with, with the, the CBC. It was a, a, an incredible event to see and to be a part of and to see those Canadians there. The, the largest single movement, I think, of Canadians uh, overseas for any event in our, uh, in our history that hasn't been connected to war. And certainly the Great War has dominated our memory. And I'll come back and talk a bit about that. But it, it's not the only reason, I think. Um, because one of the things I did notice that when we talked about the Second World War in Canada, when I began to study it and learn it, uh, I went to university in the early 1990s. I started working at the National Archives of Canada from about 1995 onwards. I've been at the War Museum from 2002. One of the things I noticed that, is that when we did talk about uh, the Second World War, we often focused on Dieppe. Um, and it, at Dieppe, um, uh, it remains, I think, uh, an event, even though it was one single day, the 19th of August, 1942, a, a terrible day, a day of tragedy, a day of loss. And yet there's something about that day that haunts us 
It has overshadowed almost every other contribution we made in the war. How many Canadians know that 100,000 Canadians served in the Italian campaign? How many Canadians know that perhaps the greatest contribution uh, of our land army in the Second World War was the clearing of the Scheldt in October and November of, of, of 1944. If we think of the contribution to the Allied war efforts, uh, how many Canadians know we fought against the Germans in the Rhineland or even what the Rhineland is? I think there is a greater sense of the liberation of the Dutch, but most Canadians could not connect the D-Day landings on the 6th of June 1944, where, as many of you know, I hope, Canada landed uh, on Juneau Beach, shoulder to shoulder with the Americans and the British, and fought for uh, almost another full year in tremendous land battles. How many Canadians know about Canada's contributions in the air war or the critical role in the Battle of the Atlantic? I think too few. And I think it is because, for the most part, we have not done a good job in telling our story, in telling our history. And so that's where the book starts, really, is the the war effort. And I jumped ahead on my slides here. I apologize. Um, and, and I wanted to explore the idea of the, the necessary war, but also how it had begun to fade away, or at least it looked that way. And this is a, this is a really unique book. There's nothing like it out there. If you know Canada's literature on the Second World War, there's quite a bit written on on battles and campaigns, uh, and yet the memory of the war um, is almost absent. And so that's, I think, a, a contribution here. And I think the subtitle of Forgetting, Remembering, and Remaking Canada's Second World War matters. The forgetting happened very quickly. The remembering took about 50 years, and I think we're in a period now of remaking that memory of war. So if we think about the end of the war, if we think about the liberation of the Dutch, one of the key things that the Canadians wanted was, was to get home. It's clear in their letters and their diaries. And one of my great pleasures in being a historian for, for 25 years has, has been uh, my, uh, my talking to veterans. Uh, the veterans uh, who, when I began to speak to them, were probably in their early 70s. And I've always taken the opportunity to ask them their stories, uh, to hear their own personal history. That, I think, is the stuff of history. Uh, and they have always been uh, sharing their stories with me once, once I think they became comfortable. But it wasn't always that way. And in fact, as I will argue uh, later in the talk and as I argue throughout the book, for many years there was a silence in our veterans community. They didn't, they didn't have uh, the language or the grammar to talk about their war experience, and we as Canadians often didn't know the questions to ask, but I'm jumping ahead a bit. At the end of the war, as Canada brought home its hundreds of thousands of sailors and airmen and soldiers and nurses and, and all the other service personnel, um, Canada treated its veterans well. And I think this is important. We had the Veterans Charter, which was a, a series of um, legislation and programs to retrain veterans. As some of you may know, maybe your parents benefited from this, maybe your grandparents did. 50,000 veterans sent off to university, more than 100,000 retrained. There were jobs uh, for uh, almost everyone. Um, and, and this new prosperity helped to drive our country forward. And the veterans came back and they played an absolutely crucial role in, in bringing us uh, into the, the second half of the 20th century. And I think if you just reflect back on the first half, think of the South African War, think of the Great War, think of the Depression, think of the Second World War. That was a grim period uh, to live through. Um, much uncertainty, much grief, much sorrow. The second half of the 20th century in Canadian history, for most Canadians, not all, but for most Canadians, has been a tremendous period of prosperity. And the Second World War launched Canada forward. We emerged from the war uh, wealthier, especially with Europe in ruins and the world going through the agonizing period of decolonization and the immediate Cold War. Canada tied to the United States economy in, in a much more central North American mindset and moving forward with incredible urbanization, 
of building up our cities and our towns, uh, and of course, the baby boom, which is so crucial to stimulating the economy. And so much of this was linked to the veterans of the Second World War. They were moving forward. They weren't looking backwards. And I think that's an important point. We wanted to leave the war behind, not because we didn't believe in the war and the war wasn't important or necessary or even just, which was made all the more clear after the revelations of the Nazi uh, Holocaust and genocide, but we were moving forward, and, and that was important. And yet, as we moved forward, we didn't do a very good job in telling our story, and this is very clear uh, from the start. And that's a theme that runs through the book, and I'll come back to it in my talk. Um, and I wondered perhaps if it was other countries as well. Did they not write about the war? But of course not. I mean, all of the major participants, be they uh, politicians or senior commanders, um, they wrote about the war because people wanted to know. And I, and I, I start my book by looking at um, the writing of the war, which after a few instant histories, uh, that came out by journalists, there was very little. Uh, Mackenzie King, our wartime prime minister, our longest serving prime minister, Weird Willie, as he is sometimes, uh, you know, taught as a strange man who talked to his dead dog and his dead mother. Of course, he was so much more. He was that. He was, he was a sad figure, and I've written a book on him, uh, lonely, um, a desperate for affection, and yet he was also a, a, a politician of tremendous tenacity and endurance uh, and, and, and our wartime leader. He never wrote about the war. He, he wrote about it in his diaries, his secret diaries, which spanned, I think, 30,000 pages or more. But think of Mackenzie, uh, think of, uh, sorry, Churchill, uh, who you see on the screen there, who is uh, not only probably the most preeminent person of the 20th century, but the, certainly the most preeminent historian of the 20th century. And one of his great lines I love is that history will look fondly upon me because I intend to write it. There's a good lesson there for politicians and others. Uh, the general you see on, on the left or my left is Harry Criar. I suspect today that not one in, pick a number, 10,000, 100,000, could even name Harry Criar. He was our general in the war. At one point, he commanded 450,000 soldiers in 1st Canadian Army, Canadians, British, Americans, other Dominion forces, other allied forces. And yet, he is largely forgotten, as are all the senior Canadian commanders. Why? Because they didn't write their memoirs. They didn't write their stories. And I explore this in the book. And Criar, um, people were begging him to write, especially as the Americans were writing their histories. And think of Eisenhower, who wrote his history, propelled him into the presidency. Think of Bradley. Um, Criar, people were asking him, please, uh, just write the history so that other nations will know about Canada's role in the war. He couldn't find the energy to do it, and it was a missed opportunity. And I also write about how veterans, and I mentioned this before, how veterans faced their own challenges. They were moving forward. They were getting on with their lives. Many of them, as we know, were 23, 24, 25 years old, some younger. They weren't thinking often um, in terms of a veteran's legacy. Uh, many of them didn't think that they had done uh, extraordinary things. Uh, they were called upon, I think we now know, to to uh, to really deliver victory in incredible hardship, and yet many of them uh, couldn't find a, a way to write about the war. And, and I've talked to veterans about this, and I've read letters and diaries from the time period. It's quite clear that they were struggling to make meaning of their war experience. And they talk about the challenges of coming home and, and trying to tell their loved ones, their parents or their siblings or their wives or their girlfriends or their children about the war, and after a while, it just became easier to be silent, to push it deep down and to move forward. I, I talk in the book about pilot officer Rod, uh, Ron Laidlaw. He served in the RCAF, and, and he wrote this uh, later looking back on his war experience. For years, I've been trying to face up to this, but my mind is like a jigsaw puzzle. I've been... Uh, my mind is like a jigsaw puzzle with many of the pieces either fuzzy or they won't fit into place or they're lost. 
As I now ponder how to handle this with the same shudder I have had for ensuing years, I find I'm able only to put swatches of scenes together, never the whole picture. And it's not easy to write books. Um, it's not easy for people to capture those experiences, many of them traumatic, uh, and, and to, to lay them out in a narrative form. And very few Canadians wrote about their war experience. I also talk about how it's not easy and it wasn't easy after the Second World War to publish books in this country. But I think, in fact, we have a greater sense today of post-traumatic stress disorder and how war imprints itself on ordinary men and women. And this was certainly the case uh, with, with this generation. The one exception to this is Charles Stacy, our official historian. Uh, I've written about Charles Stacy's in my other books, uh, Cleo's Warriors, which is an exploration of the writing of the official history in Canada. I went into tremendous depth here. Canada was very lucky to have Colonel Stacy. He was a first-class historian. He had an incredible ability to work under a strain and stress. And think of trying to write the initial histories. And he wrote a history, a, a one-volume history in 1948, which won the Governor General's Award. Yeah, it's a tremendous book. And yet he was dealing with millions of pages of documentation to try to understand the war effort, even though he served overseas uh, and was friendly with many of the senior generals. And yet what he faced in his, his histories that were to follow, and I should note here that in 1948, the government of the day canceled the Navy's official history program and the Air Force history program. And that led to a really detrimental um, silence for both the Air Force and the Navy. Again, curtailing our story, especially when the Americans and the British and the French and every other nation were writing their official histories. Uh, the American histories, I believe, span over a hundred volumes, and Canada could not uh, could not even decide to fund uh, a series for our Navy, of which a hundred thousand Canadians served. Uh, in addition, a uh, twelve thousand in the Merchant Navy who served. Uh, 250,000 in the Air Force. And so our history, I argue in the book in more detail, was largely left untold. And I wondered why was that? Was it because we were afraid of the cost in the war? We had 45,000 Canadians who died in the war. Another 55,000 were wounded. Um, I don't think that's the case. Uh, there were many other countries that suffered more, that lost more casualties. I think uh, another factor in why we, we didn't focus on the incredible contributions of Canada during the Second World War was the legacy of the Great War. And I think if we, we think of the memorial landscape and we think, speaking to you in Guelph, of John McCrae and in Flanders Fields and the incredible resonance of his poem and the poppy the creation of Remembrance Day, first Armistice Day in 1919, later renamed Remembrance Day in 1931. If we think of the thousands of memorials built across the country, stained glass windows and the stone uh, memorials and the plaques, the Great War traumatized Canadians, 66,000 killed from a country of 8 million. In the 1920s, we were struggling to come to grips with that sacrifice. We were struggling to make meaning of that war. And that generation turned to memorials. And they said, we will never forget. And that was an important impulse. And of course, it goes on to monuments in, in Ottawa, the National Memorial, and the Vimy overseas, and Beaumont Hamel and other sites as well. And so the question is, what happened in 1945? Where were the memorials to the Second World War generation? Well, there was a great debate in Canada, and I write about this in the book. When the generation came back from the war, and of course we had about 1.1 million who served and 45,000 were killed, so over a million veterans who returned to Canadian society, they too asked, how will we mark this war? And they asked it through the Royal Canadian Legion, as it was known at the time, the Canadian Legion. And the Legion fought for a new memorial for the Second World War veterans. They accepted the poppy. They accepted Remembrance Day, although in the book I talk about this really fascinating debate among Second World War veterans who are saying, why do we have to stand in the cold on November 11th? Why not the 6th of June, D-Day, where all the services uh, were involved? 
Why not the 8th of May? Why not the 15th of August? Those dates should mean something to you. But one of the challenges, of course, is which date would you have picked? The global war effort during the Second World War, uh, where Canada fought around the world, um, paradoxically made it more difficult to pick a single date or a single battle to mark in a commemorative way that aspect of the struggle. And so November 11th was kept. And the memorials, for the most part, Can Canadians turned to building utilitarian memorials. Now, these were memorials that uh, would be in the communities. They would be vibrant places like libraries or swimming pools or parks, places of animation, of laughing, and of the community. Um, they would honor the fallen. They would be living memorials. And this is what most Canadians wanted. The Legion itself said, we understand this, and this is important, and, and we accept the notion that we will simply add the names of the fallen to the existing memorials in those communities. Very few communities built another memorial. As you can see in some of the photographs here, they simply added, excuse me, the names. Um, it wasn't always easy because those memorials were built when they hoped for the war to end all wars. No one thought they would fought to fight another world war within a, a generation. But what the veterans hoped for was a new national memorial. And I've uncovered this story uh, in the book. I think it's a fascinating story. The National Memorial in Ottawa, you'll, you'll remember, was unveiled in May of 1939. The response, as it's called, um, really marked um, in the nation's capital the Great War sacrifice. But when the veterans came back, they wanted their own memorial. And if you've been to the memorial, as I suspect you have, you know the 22 figures passing through the arch are all depicted in tremendous detail, but they're all wearing Great War uniforms, not surprisingly. The Second World War um, veterans asked for their own memorial. And they turned to the Mackenzie King government, and there was quite a debate, and I talk about this um, uh, in the book. And, and by late 1945, the Mackenzie King government says no. They will not build a national memorial. And in fact, the national memorial, Mackenzie King said, would be Ottawa itself. The beautification of Ottawa would be the national memorial. Now, that's a strange thing. I've lived in Ottawa 46 of my 48 years. I sort of knew that story, but I never thought it was true. Um, that was the plan. Not surprisingly, veterans were, were very unhappy about that, since most of them did not live in Ottawa. Uh, and, and they also didn't think that the beautification of Ottawa would be a sacred memorial. Again, most of them understood the need for these functional utilitarian memorials, but creating a swimming pool or even a garden or a library was not to create a sacred monument. Uh, and, and there's quite a pointed discussion where the Mackenzie King government is accused of, of really trying to solve, as the Edmonton Journal lamented, the memorial problem by giving that name to some utilitarian project we meant to complete anyway, war or no war. And you can see some of the anger there. The failure to build um, a memorial, the failure to tell our story, um, the failure um, to look back and to move forward meant that the war was rapidly left behind us. This necessary war where Canada had fought and bled and, and punched far above its weight was left behind very quickly as we move forward into the prosperous second half of the 20th century. And overseas as well, even though we had Vimy and Beaumont Hamel, we did not have anything uh, at Juneau Beach. And I talk about this, how Canadians who went back to Juneau Beach, who went back to Dieppe, looking to perhaps pay homage to their fallen comrades or perhaps to stand in the steps of their loved ones who had fallen or simply veterans to return back, they were dismayed that there was no memorial there and no plans to build a memorial. And the absence overseas as well allowed other nations to forget our story. To give you one example, by the late 20th century, about a million visitors a year were going to the Normandy region um, in forms of pilgrimages and battlefield tours. And, and for much of that history, Canada was absent. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. 
The Cold War, as Canada moved into the Cold War, was another component. And so I, as I argue in the book, as we didn't build the memorials, as we didn't tell our stories, the Cold War as well had an impact on how we remembered the Second World War. And I talk about the Kurt Meyer trial in uh, late 1945, early 1946. It's a fascinating story. Those of you who don't know, Kurt Meyer commanded the 12th SS, Hitler Youth in Normandy. The Canadians fought against the 12th SS uh, in June and in August again, ultimately annihilating the 12th SS. But they were a vicious enemy. And in the first week in Normandy, the 12th SS, which is one of the the, the finest German armored divisions on the Western Front relentlessly attacked the Canadians, of which the Canadians held their bridgehead. They held the beachhead against the Germans uh, in, in a spectacular role of defensive fighting. And yet uh, the 12th SS were trained and encouraged not to take prisoners. And in a shocking, uh, a shocking revelation, um, in the months followed as the Canadians pushed forward, they found that at least 156 Canadians had been executed on the battlefield after falling into the hands of the Germans. Um, and so they tried Kurt Mar Meyer, who was a brigadier at the, at the start of Normandy and then later commander of the division when the divisional commander was killed. Uh, and it's an incredible story. And I don't have time to go into the details here, although the book is for sale and it's 20% off, so I encourage you to pick it up. Um, but how Meyer was treated and then uh, later imprisoned in Canada and then released when West Germany demanded his release had an impact on the memory of Canada's uh, contributions during the Second World War. And so we can see here both through Meyer, through West Germany being brought into NATO in the Cold War and other factors, and certainly the idea that Canada was was moved from the Second World War into another kind of permanent low-grade war had an impact on what we thought about the Second World War. And I think when we did think about war uh, from the 1960s onwards, we often thought about it through the lens of the peacekeeper. It's a, it's a comfortable image. Of course, I'm very proud of Pearson and his role in the Suez Crisis. I'm proud that he received the, new, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. I'm proud of our, the contributions of our Canadian forces. And yet, in my many years of speaking to members of the Canadian forces, perhaps the most common thing I've heard from them is that they find it aggravating to think that somehow peacekeepers are separate from soldiers. They're not. They are one and the same. And the, the skills that you are trained for to be uh, in the Canadian forces in whatever time period are the same that you carry into peacekeeping with additional training, obviously. And yet, it's a comfortable image for us. It allowed us to distinguish ourselves from the United States. It allowed us to think of ourselves as the helpful fixers on the world stage. It allowed us to create a new martial symbol, all of which was important. And yet, at the expense, I think, um, uh, that uh, of Canada's contribution, not just in the Second World War, but in the six wars we fought in the 20th century. Think of the South African War, the Great War, the Second World War, the Korean War, the Cold War, Gulf War 1990, the Kosovo bombing campaign. Think of the Afghanistan mission. Think of the 19th century wars of survival. Think of the 18th century wars that define the very nation that we live in today and the wars before that between indigenous people and settlers and between indigenous uh, groups and bands as well. I'm not arguing that we only understand our history through military, uh, military affairs and conflict, but to deny that that is a part of our history is simply wrong. And I argue in the book that in the 60s and 70s, that is what we did. We, we willfully were blinded to the fact that we had served and contributed in wars and that wars had deeply shaped us. And certainly the Vietnam War, as you see in this image, uh, had a role in that as well. By 1968, I talk about in the book, um, Remembrance Day was a very, very a poorly attended. In fact, the Globe and Mail described it as no longer a day of relevance, but one of public indifference, public indifference. And I talk about in the book, uh, Barney Danson, who would later, who was a veteran of the Second World War, he tables a bill in the late 1960, in the late 1960s to shift Remembrance Day because nobody is coming out anymore. 
uh, and, and the Legion fights against us, but even the Legion acknowledges that nobody seems to care. And there's a great uh, worry among many veterans that their war uh, has been forgotten. And I continue on in the book to explore this through a number of, of themes, um, but to come back to the idea of failing to tell our stories, it is never more apparent, I think, in the war films. And, and this is, we really know how people understand memory in a significant way. Think of The Longest Day from 1962. Think of Saving Private Ryan from uh, 98. Um, this is how people understand war. Think of Band of Brothers. Think of The Great Escape. I've been able to track the story of film, and it's fascinating. In the 1940s and 50s, there were hundreds of war films covering almost every type of theme, and yet almost nothing produced by Canada. The Longest Day, which was a major D-Day film from 1962, the largest big-budgeted black-and-white film up to that point in history, uh, was a really key event. And I talk about in the book how veterans uh, heard about this, and how they came together and how there were celebrations and pageantry, military pageantry and, um, and, and marching bands as they went in to see the longest day where Canadians had landed on one of the five beaches on D-Day. And they left so disappointed because Canada, as many of you know, is barely mentioned in the film. The Great Escape is even crazier, um, where the Canadian contributions in The Great Escape um, were completely written out of that movie, and the Canadian roles played, uh, you know, um, in, even as, as a Canadian, Wally Flood was involved in, in helping to get the, the um, mechanics right, but the, the Canadians um, who, who were involved in The Great Escape in 1944, they are played by Americans in this film. Again, I don't expect Hollywood to tell the Canadian story. And yet Canadians have never done a very good job even trying. It's not easy to make movies in this country. And yet where is the CBC? Where is the NFB in telling our stories? And I, I recount the one series that the NFB did in 1962 called Canada at War. It's a pretty good series, a 13-part series. And yet it came very late after every other country had created documentaries and films and even then, um, even though critics said, finally, we have a Canadian story, the CBC put it on at 1030 at night in its first airing. Uh, and there was a great debate among people saying, well, why isn't it earlier so that our children can know about this? Who's staying up at 1030? Again, a self-inflicted wound. And I continue on in the book looking at um, the key role of Dieppe in our history and how that has often shrouded our many other contributions. Um, and, and, and finally, the absolute low point in passing through the 1980s, where very few Canadians seem to want to talk about Canada's contribution, uh, The Valor and the Horror, a three-part film created by the NFB in partnership with the CBC, which, um, if you remember it, was uh, won all kinds of awards and was seen by millions of Canadians who wanted to know the story, and yet it it really featured and and highlighted um, disgrace and defeat um, episodes on Hong Kong, um, not on D Day and the incredible contributions of Canadians, but on the one significant feat in defeat in Normandy, the Battle of Verrier Ridge. Um, a bizarre telling, right? It, it's almost as if Canada was on the losing side in this war. And in the third episode on Bomber Command, it looked like and Canadians were depicted almost as war criminals. Um, it was slick storytelling, but bad history. And that was the low point. And veterans were galvanized um, in their anger around the valor and the horror. And there's a, a tremendous... Um, outpouring of anger in the Legion magazine and in other publications and in newspapers with one combat veteran demanding what kind of people have snatched the torch we hope to pass to young Canadians. I mean, there was a real sense of betrayal here that Canadians not only had silenced the war effort, but now they had reshaped it into a story of defeat and disgrace. 
And then it changed. And then we began to remember. And we began to pay attention to our veterans. And it came at the 50th anniversary. In 1994 and 1995, some uh, 10 to 15,000 Canadian veterans went back to Europe. There they were greeted as the liberators that they were, these aged warriors who had helped deliver freedom to the French and especially to the Dutch. And this was covered by our national um, uh, broadcasters. And Canadians woke up to find that we had thousands of veterans in our midst and that we, as Canadians, were not just a nation of peacekeepers, that we had contributed to victory. And that, I argue, is the turning point um, in, the, in our memory of the Second World War. Since that point, we have paid more attention to our veterans. They, as they retired, began to go into classrooms and to tell their stories. We began to record their stories through massive oral history projects. Uh, there was a new surge in the writing about history in this country. That's the generation that I come from. Veterans as well began to write their own memoirs and to tell their stories. And I think over the last 25 years, we have seen a surge in among Canadians, uh, especially around Remembrance Day. Before that point, many of you may remember, very few people came out to Remembrance Day. Now the crowds are larger, and yet sadly, in this year, the 75th anniversary of the end of the war, now that we have only about 30,000 veterans, all of them about 94 years of age or older, now they're almost all gone. And so my book, looks at the forgetting of the war, um, the denigration of it in cultural products, but then at the end, the remaking over the last 25 years, how veterans themselves began to actively make their own history. It was veterans who were responsible for building the Juneau Beach Center at Juneau Beach in 2003. Um, the Canadian War Museum, which opened in 2005, veterans played a key role there in raising funds for the museum. And all of this, and I'll wrap up here, because I would like to hear your questions and comments or observations, so I'll, I'll just speak for another minute or two. I think all of this reminds me of many things. Um, we need to tell our story. We're in a contentious period now where history is often weaponized, that history is used by groups as a divisive event. I'm not saying we need heroic history or hand on the heart history or stand behind the flag, but I do think we need to embrace the past in its complexity, but also to talk, if we think just about the Second World War, of the massive contributions uh, that Canadians made in that absolutely necessary war. How did we forget it? How did we let it be denigrated? How did we forget to tell our story? I think that's something we need to remember and to reflect upon. And to come back to the title of the fight for history, it's not easy to do history. It's not a, not easy in this day in a day um, in this day of digitized history, in this constant uh, bombardment of news to reflect upon the past. It takes work, but we have to fight for our history, and we have to fight against the apathy. I think that is often so detrimental in telling our story. And it takes teachers and students, it takes curators and archivists, it takes historians and filmmakers and poets and uh, others who create art. It takes individual Canadians who may or may not have a link to the Second World War and yet who understand that it is our shared past that keeps us and binds us together in the present and helps us to go forward into the future. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Tim. Uh, we do have a lot of questions uh, and uh, a, cu a couple of really good comments. And um, one was that a couple of people wanted to mention Farley Mullet's The Regiment. And also, um, I also wanted to mention The Guns of Normandy, um, the George Blackburn uh, trilogy that I thought was really good. And, and uh, people wanted to, to know what whether you thought these looks like these should be like on a Canada Reads. Um, 
Yeah, it's a great question. And the regiment, I think, is one of the finest regimental histories in publication. It's not really a regimental history. It's it's Farley Mowat trying to come to grips, I think, with his with his own war experience and that of his comrades. And it's it's a stunningly good book. Uh, it's one of the very few, and I write about it in, in my own book that came out. It comes out. It's 1979, I think. Um, a, a really important book. Um, and George Blackburn, I write about in the book because that's that's a game changer. When that comes out in in um, the mid 90s, after, you know, in the midst of the revival, it's a national bestseller, as many of you know, and it really opens the eyes of many Canadians to the experience. Uh, in the case of fighting through Normandy. And um, and I talk about George Blackburn. I was able to meet him and talk to him many times in my life. Um, and um, I, there's a letter um, of someone who wrote to Blackburn, and he, and he wrote something to the effect of, I read your book, and now I have a sense of what my dad did during the war. Um, and I'm paraphrasing here. We were never able to talk about his experience, but through your book... George Blackbird's book, I have a better sense of what my dad did. And I think there were many Canadians who felt that way. Uh, and that's part of the, the resurgence, I argue, over the last 25 years. Uh, I did have uh, another question. Um, uh, it's, uh, the official historian C.P. Stacey made some disparaging comments about the quality of Canadian training in England. Uh, could you comment on the veracity of this opinion and more importantly, its influence on our subsequent history, historiography. Yeah, great question. And I talk about Stacy uh, in the book in quite a lot of detail. And for those of you who don't know, Stacy wrote uh, three army histories and then an overview history of, of the Canadian government policy, which are all classics. On one page in his book, he, he wrote about the failure in Normandy, as he saw it, of the Canadian forces to push deeper um, against the Germans. And uh, I think he was wrong. And um, later in life, and I've been through the archival papers of uh, C.P. Stacey in the early 80s, he reflected on that comment and he wrote that he wished he hadn't written it. He thought it was truthful, but he said there were no other armies that were any better, the British or the Americans, um, who, who had fought more effectively against the Germans. Now, Stacey was part of the generation that, um, that um, studied the German army and how effective they were in fighting on the defensive and how effective they were in regrouping after being annihilated time and time again in battle. Um, but the key element, I think historians have written about this, myself included in my two-volume history, is that the Germans, for the most part, were fighting on the defensive. And in fighting in, on the defensive, if we think of in Italy and we think of in uh, Normandy, uh, especially with anti-tank guns, um, uh, provided a tremendous advantage to the defender. Now, the Allied forces had greater firepower, and they had there were more of them, and yet there it was very, very difficult ever to advance forward um, through Normandy, if I'll just focus on that. And so just to come back to the question, yes, Stacy. Um, in a throw, not a throwaway remark, because I think he meant it. He said that some of the Canadian officers were not well trained, uh, and um, but he said the fighting man was unparalleled insofar as that the fighting soldiers, the Canadians, were better, uh, were as good as anyone else. And yet it was that uh, the former line that the Canadian, some of the junior officers were not as effective. Uh, which other nations uh, focused on. And I think here of um, uh, several British and American authors who have taken that and and really a lack of understanding of how effective the Canadians were to denigrate the Canadian forces. Uh, as a final thought, and there's more on this in the book because I do address this, um, they, the British and the Americans and the Germans tend to focus on the Canadians in Normandy when we were learning to fight but not the Scheldt campaign, where the Canadians soundly defeated the Germans who were on the defensive in superior position, and certainly not in the Rhineland or in liberating the Netherlands. So it's a very narrow focus uh, from British and American historians often who don't really know the Canadian story. Uh, but as you have mentioned, C.P. Stacey is often used as, um, as some ammunition or fodder uh, in that discussion. I think it has changed in recent uh, decades. Uh, Terry Kopp, uh, the most important historian, and more recently Mark Milner, I think, have proven 
beyond a doubt that the Canadians were an effective fighting force. Thanks, Tim. Um, another question. Uh, how do we commemorate or memorialize appropriately without falling into the hero worship trap that's prevalent in the United States, where some service members are placed on a pedestal? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I, and it's one that we should talk about. It's one that we need to discuss and debate. I think the answer is not what we have done, or at least we did for 50 years, which was to ignore our history, which was to pretend that we didn't have veterans amongst us because we were a peacekeeping uh, nation or the peaceful nation. Um, every veteran that I have talked to has always said to me a couple of things, um, that they didn't think that they were heroes, that they were doing a dirty job. And I, and I have always tried to write my history that way. I think there are tremendous acts of courage and bravery and self-sacrifice that are just uh, staggering to, to read about and to understand. And yet not every soldier was brave and not every soldier was in battle. We know that. Um, so that's worth keeping in mind, ordinary Canadians, but really thrust into extraordinary situations. Uh, how we commemorate them, how we talk about them, uh, that is part of the debt, I think, that we owe to veterans. And, and again, there's no simple answer there. I've never met a veteran who wanted to be venerated in some way and to be held up as some untouchable hero. But I think the starting point is to talk about our history, to engage with it truthfully, to tell hard truths, but also not be afraid in that very Canadian way of, of perhaps saying that Canada did something important. We did. We need to tell that story. Thanks, Tim. Um, another one. Um, what suggestions do you have uh, to the legions and veterans associations to better tell our stories? Well, I, I think they have a sense. They they have ideas of moving forward, and they don't need Tim Cook to tell them. Um, I would say that our the legions have are moving moving through a difficult period, and COVID has been devastating to them in individual legion halls as it is others. I think one of the things that we must do in this country, and I'm so surprised we haven't done it, is to to engage in a in a documentary series to tell our story and to present it in prime time on CBC. Um, we're, CBC should be telling our story. And I, you know, I'm a great, great champion of CBC radio, which I think does a great job in reaching into our communities. Um, but I, I do feel that they need to tell this history story. And that's a good place to start. Um, and, I, and I know that in many of the Legion halls across this country where I visit, um, they have made a concentrated effort in these final years, again, to remind us that our Second World War veterans are 94 years of age or older, um, to, to remember, to mark, to bear witness to that generation that will soon be passing on. Uh, in the last 15 or 20 years, I think our museums and our archives have done a good job in recording these stories uh, in our communities and at the national level. I think we've done a good job in writing our history books, but we must be vigilant. And I think this year, the 75th anniversary, would have been one where we would have done that. And at my museum, the Canadian War Museum, we have a major exhibition opening uh, in November called uh, Forever Change, which explores the Second World War. And I hope you, some of you will have a chance to visit that. It'll be open for about a year. Thanks. Uh now, um, the next question is, um, going forward, how should we create locations of memory to properly commemorate the Second World War, especially as those veterans passed away in a time where statues to the public must represent an absolute good or also becomes a symbol of divisiveness? Yeah, it's a great question. We, we're we actually in a period where we've been building new memorials. There's the new Holocaust Memorial in Ottawa. Um, there is the new Afghanistan memorial to be uh, unveiled in 2023 or 2024. We are also tearing down memorials across the country. And so the memorials are part of our commemorative landscape that are in a, in a period of much contested history at the moment. Um, we don't have a memorial to the Second World War. The, the names, uh, the dates, uh, to the Second World War were added to the National Memorial in 1982. Is it too late? The Americans didn't build their memorial until 2004. 
Perhaps it is. Perhaps we don't need to build a, a separate memorial. I think the National Memorial in Ottawa now stands for all of our veterans and service personnel. I wonder about overseas, though, and I think of Vimy being such a, a powerful place, a, a site of memory, a, a site of sorrow, a place of pride, a, a place that draws Canadians back to it. The Juno Beach Centre is an important site uh, and has become more important over the last 17 years. Um, should we engage in other memorial uh, building? Um, that may be a, a discussion or a debate we wish to have. Do we, um, do we turn to uh, more cultural products and in, in so less along the memorial landscape and more in telling our story? I think that's something too. I think thirdly, uh, one of the things I hear from Canadians across the country is we need to teach our history more effectively. I think that we cannot be afraid of our history um, and that too is a challenging uh, area um, with history being uh, guided, I think, at the provincial level uh, so that there isn't a national story overall. All of these come together and I think that my book is an important starting place to think about these things, but it's, it's not the final discussion in any way. And I hope people will go forward in their own communities uh, and think about their own history and how uh, their personal history or the community history links up to the national and to the international. Thanks. Um, next question is, um, uh, do you see a cleavage between what the government elite were interested in commemorating officially and what the everyday person was remembering personally? I, I don't, I, no. Uh, I think, I think it's too simple to sit, to blame Mackenzie King and his government for the lack of a memorial, or it's too simple to say we didn't write our memoirs, uh, or it's too easy to say the CBC failed to do this or that. But I think together uh, in a in a series of events, um, we failed to tell our story. And uh, I think there's a challenge that I write about this in the book when we talk about veterans. They're not a monolithic group, just like we wouldn't say workers or just Canadians writ large, we know there are there are all kinds of divisions uh, amongst our social groups and the same thing with veterans as well. I've met many veterans in my time period who were absolutely against war and, and, and understood that it's a horrific event that imprints itself on people. And yet um, a few of those who were Second World War veterans understood that the war they fought in had to be fought. Um, so I think um, it is often the state, uh, the government, that is often involved in many of these key events, and, and they play a key role in this as well. Um, and I think of Veterans Affairs, which has done uh, a, a fine job over the last 10 or 15 years in telling these stories. But this wasn't um, uh, one of our impulses uh, for the first 50 years or so after the Second World War. Think of the second half of the 20th century. And by not doing that, uh, we allowed our stories to be forgotten. Thanks. Um, do we have time for a couple more? Sure. Okay. Um, I'll read this whole question. There's a sort of a comment and a question. Uh, how should we honor the service and sacrifice of Canadians who were caught in post-war controversy? And he's thinking of the uh, AVM Harris determination to break German morale by Bomber Command um, and related to uh, the book Fire and Fury and the controversy around Bomber Command's role in the um, Canadian War Museum's exhibit display. Um, how should we fairly tell their stories? Uh, well, I write about that in the book. I write about, I write about uh, Bomber Harris. I write about the controversy over bombing from the war years to the present. And I write about the War Museum and the Bomber Command controversy we had there. Um, and uh, I explore it in, in a lot of detail, and I won't go into quite all that now. I, I do think if you're interested, you, you'll want to read that in the book. And yet, to understand Harris and, and the role of Bomber Command in the war, we have to understand the context. Of course, it was a Bomber Command was the only way for the Allies to strike back against uh, Germany uh, up until um, mid-43, and that the Bomber Command crews paid a terrible price uh, in their relentless assaults. Um, they played a key role in um, breaking German wartime industry and breaking morale. 
Um, the war, um, no single arm won the war, but Bomber Command surely played its part. And yet it's also wrong in every way, um, as some veterans have said, is that, that they didn't know that they were bombing um, cities filled with people and that they thought that they were targeting industry. That has been irrefutably proved to be wrong. Um, bomber um, veterans may have thought that, um, and some have written about that experience for themselves. But, you know, a thousand bombers dropping uh, a thousand uh, tons of bombs um, indiscriminately destroy cities. And it's quite, quite clearly that was the case. Um, I also note in the book, however, that the Germans started um, area bombing in both world wars, uh, and that they started the terror bombing against civilians in a deliberate policy in the Second World War as well. Um, and so this isn't to run away from it. It's not to paper over the past. We must address it, but we should understand it in the context of the time. And I, I explore that in the book, and I explore the ways that the memory of, of the bombing campaign went through various cycles. Uh, and I, I think for anyone interested in understanding that, this, this is an important book. Thank you. Um, I think one of the last questions, are, are we doing an appropriate job of publishing the memoirs and current history of the Afghanistan conflict? Uh, the common is there's lots of publications from the media and reporters, but not much from service members. Uh, how could we do more? Yeah, that's a great question. And I've, I've thought about that. Um, we have seen more uh, memoirs published uh, from Afghanistan veterans. The writing of history tends to go through uh, interesting cycles that it uh, tends to be the senior commanders who write and politicians and often journalists who are on the ground and have the right skills. They are professional writers. It often takes longer for veterans to I think as I write about in my, my book, The Fight for History, to gather their thoughts, to process them, and to, and to write their experiences. Um, what I have found is that Canadians still very much want to read about those experiences and that those books sell well and reach wide audiences. Um, and I, I suspect the challenge is in veterans um, finding finding the, the time to, to sit and to write and to work through their experiences. And that can be a very painful process. Um, some veterans talk about it being a cathartic process to work through some of that trauma. And it's not always trauma, of course. There are, are many positive experiences of comradeship, um, things that we as civilians can never understand. And yet it's not an easy thing to do. Um, I, I don't know if there are veterans who have written about their experiences or possibly even members of the Canadian Forces, um, I encourage them to write. I encourage them to archive their letters and emails. Um, this is the stuff of history that will allow future generations to understand the experiences of Canadians in Afghanistan, of which some 40,000 were there uh, in a significant contribution from Canada. And I, I think that's an important aspect. And we maybe we'll see, like the Second World War, that it takes time to move through that experience. Um, but then um, there will be a period of oral histories and writing memoirs for family members and possibly as well uh, um, a greater number of published memoirs. I personally hope that that is the case. And um, as, a, as an archivist, as a former archivist, as a historian, um, we need to hear those voices. That's important for us to to understand our our shared history. Thanks, Tim. Um, let's let's make this our last question. Uh, do you think the American reaction to the defeat in Vietnam uh, was the res resulting cultural and the resulting cultural response had a cooling effect on Remembrance Day in Canada? It definitely did, uh, and I write about that in the book and. Uh, what I also find interesting is that in 1984, the 40th anniversary of D-Day, and I, and I write about that in the book, when Ronald Reagan went back to D-Day, and that was the first major transnational event. Uh, Reagan uh, and his administration used the, Cana the American um, invasion on D-Day to help clear away the memories of, of Vietnam. And from that point forward, we see a much stronger push in the United States in histories and memoirs and uh, in, in major cultural products based on World War II. 
And yet again, it is the American story. And I write about 1984, where Canada was represented by Pierre Trudeau, who was only to, you know, only a few weeks away from leaving office. Uh, and by most accounts, he, he did not do a great job in talking about the Canadian experience. And instead, he decided to talk about peace and Canada's role in bringing peace to the world. And the veterans who were there uh, saw that as just one more example of how political leaders had, had denied um, their wartime contributions and had failed to stand up and tell the Canadian story. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, well, I want to thank you again for this memorable and thought-provoking talk. Uh, the t reminder that this talk has been recorded uh, and will be posted on a Guelph Museum's website uh, after November 11th, uh, that Tim's book is available for sale. And uh, you can see that uh, if you want the discount, uh, go to the Random House website. And, uh, um, and next month, we will have another military lecture. Uh, it is on a Wednesday. It's October 21st at 7 p.m. And the uh, speaker is Dana Wiener, and she's talking about uh, fighting for citizenship, uh, Black Union soldiers uh, on the battlefield and in politics. And I think that'll be a really fascinating topic. So uh, I'm sure it'll be another great talk. And uh, thank you again, Tim, for another amazing presentation. Uh, too bad it's not in person, but we uh, enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for our audience and all the great questions too. They're fantastic.